so thank you. appreciate that. The, it's been a long time since I did this type of work, but I'll do the best I can. Um, and I've never tried to do anything in 30 minutes, so this is going to be a disaster for me, I'm sure, ahead of time. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. The overall premise that I had as I was starting to put these presentations together was I had in the back of my mind, incorrectly, clearly, that the vast majority of coaches in this region at some point I'd come into pretty close contact with. In my days of giving the coach two or the coach three, I thought I'd seen most of these guys, half of them are gonna be my staff, and so I don't wanna just deliver the same old, same old. I wanna try to bring something new to it. Um, and now I look at half of you, I go like, I don't know you, I've never met you before in my life. So, uh, so we'll see how this goes, because a lot of it is based on, on essentially just ideas that I've learned over the years from Louie or Wayne or all the other great people I've been able to learn from and things that I've been teaching in the coach two and three years ago um, and now going like okay how's my thinking on that evolved or, or, or changed or anything I was kind of thinking that way as I put these presentations together is how to evolve some of the stuff that uh, that I would have presented in the past but if you never saw what I presented in the past then uh, it's gonna be a lot of content in, in 30 minutes but whatever we'll see how it goes the coach-player relationship one was uh, was one that was important uh, to me, but not something I'd ever presented on before. So this is purely new thinking on my part. And as the as the slide says, really, I start off as just my best guess because anybody here who tells me that they're an expert in building relationships, whether that's with your spouse or your children or your players, I you know I call BS on that right away. It's that that's a life's journey to try to find a, a way to build these relationships. But just from brainstorming and reflecting on it myself, the, the three things that came in my mind right away were the idea that um, you know, if we're going to be in a relationship with people, the key is trust. Uh, the second thing was our ability to, to build belief in, the, in our athletes. And the third one was that it would be fun and enjoyment. But the thing that most importantly I came to me was like, I can't possibly be the expert in this. Um, and it would be interesting since it's the coach-player relationship to hear from the players too. So I had, I sent an email, I don't expect you to have to read all that, but I sent an email to four people that I do or have coached, and I just asked them to answer these questions. So um, the questions were, what do you think are the most important aspects of having a great player-coach relationship? Can you explain the way your childhood coach fostered a good relationship with you? Uh, explain any tour uh, or college coaches that foster a good relationship with you and how it's different than the same? Um, and although this presentation is meant to be from a positive angle, if there's anything that if you've always found tough with coaches, then please share it because we'd like to learn from it. So I thought we'd probably get a better chance to learn from the players in these things. So hi, my name's Stephanie Silva, and I'm just doing a quick video for uh, Larry's coaching workshop. Please excuse my voice. I'm actually sick right now and sound kind of terrible. Um, the first question was the most important aspects to having a good player-coach relationship. So I have quite a few. I would say the first one is respect. So you have to have a mutual respect between the coach and the player. So you want your player to respect you so that they want to work hard for you. But the coach also has to respect the player and like understand them and kind of know uh, when they're being they're pushing them too hard or too little and just having that like mutual understanding. Uh, the next one is trust. So you have to trust that one, you know what your co the coach knows what they're doing and you trust what they're trying to do with your game. And I think that comes a lot with the coach being open to the player and telling them how they want to develop their game, going through it step by step. Um, and also just trust that your coach is always going to have your back and that they want what's best for you. They're not just like, I don't know, trying to make money off of you or something. Um, I openness again, so just being open with your player and having your player feel like they can be open with you, tell you what's going on and what um they might be thinking on the court and just like not being afraid to be judged. Uh dependability slash loyalty. So just again knowing that your coach is gonna be there for you whenever you need and uh they're dependable. They put in the time and they make the time for you if like you're a really high player high level player um fairness so treating you the same as all the other kids like it's terrible to have an unfair coach who is like um chooses favorites or whatever and lastly positivity i really like uh positive reinforcement and i don't think that like negative uh like fear factors and stuff to make players work hard is the right way to go so i would say uh positivity 
and just overall positivity, like um, trying to get them to be more positive about themselves, their game, good self-talk, things like that. I think a coach can really affect. Um, the second question was the way your childhood coach fostered a good relationship with you. So basically all the things I just said, respect, trust, openness, dependability, and uh, fairness and positivity. And the other thing I would add is dedication. So my coach has always been really dedicated to me. I don't know if I'm allowed to name them, but like they know who they are because they'll probably be there. And uh, yeah, so just being like super dedicated to me and my game and knowing that like they really want what's best for me. And just again, positivity and positive reinforcement. Uh, the only bad coach experience I would have is I would say when coaches either pick favorites and then like make other players feel kind of bad and also um being overly negative so like especially like using kind of fear as a tool to make your players work harder so sometimes yeah we deserve to like run suicides whatever if everyone's goofing off and like not working hard or anything but just using like too many punishments and uh just being like super negative like yelling too much like obviously sometimes everyone deserves to be like yelled at or like come on like get it together but um just doing it all the time is so bad and it, i think it builds such an unhealthy relationship with your player because i think your player is going to lose respect for you but they're, they're only going to do it out of fear but they're not going to respect you anymore which is kind of like the most important thing in a coach player relationship and uh yeah that's about it so thank you bye Hello, my name is James McGee. I'm from Dublin, Ireland. Um, I'm a former professional tennis player. I played 10 years on the ATB Tour, a uh, career high ranking of 140 in the world in singles. I played Davis Cup for Ireland. I played all the Grand Slams, qualified into the US Open in 2014, and uh, really had a chance to, to dedicate my whole life to professional tennis. And uh, the reason I'm uh, creating this video is to talk about some of the aspects of coaching that helped me d down through the years, how my um, childhood coach helped me, how my uh, college coach helped me and how my professional uh, coach on the tour helped me. Um, looking back uh, when I was, you know, 13, 14 years of age, I think one of the things that um, Larry helped me with, Larry Jurovic, um, is he was a really great listener um, w whenever we were uh, doing our coaching sessions. I felt like he was able to listen and to understand what I was going through at the time. Certainly at 13, 14 years of age, you're going through a lot of emotions and I was struggling with, with my anger and, and controlling my emotions on the court. And I always felt listened to when I was with Larry. So that was the first thing, was certainly being a good listener. Uh, the second thing that I felt Larry hel helped me with was um, he used to always say things like, you know, you chase down every ball, you don't let one ball go by you. And he, he, he kept reinforcing this belief in me that I was one of these players that just didn't give up on any ball and kind of like a positive label. And I felt like that really helped me because as he told me that every day, I, I saw myself as a player that, you know, was a fighter and someone that never gave up. And he kept encouraging me to be that type of a player. So having, you know, those two things, they were the, they're the two things that certainly helped. Obviously, he helped me from a technical point of view as well and from a tactical point of view. But the thing that really stands out to me long term wise is um, is the mental aspect of, it, of of his coaching and how he listened to me and, and, and that. And, and looking at my career and thinking back to the coaches that helped me and that maybe I, I struggled with, I felt the coaches that that were that I gelled the most with were the ones that kept me relaxed on the court. I was a, a player that really got fired up and and uh, liked to get really into matches. But the key thing for me was was staying relaxed and keeping that kind of ideal performance state. And so for the coaches that I gelled with were the ones that could make me laugh before go, going out onto the court and keep things relaxed and keep the practice sessions relaxed. I never really had an issue with working hard. If anything, it was the opposite. I had to be pulled back and I had to be, I had to learn how to relax and to slow down. So, so that was really important. And I think every single tennis player is different. Some players are very um, high energy and some are low energy. And if you have a low energy player, you might need to be one of those coaches that learns to um, psych your player up a little bit or get them excited or get the, get the engine going. Um, and so, all in all, when I look at the best coaches or the ones that had the biggest influence on my life, I would I would look at uh, I always would look at their ability to listen and to understand, um, to ask great questions, always to encourage positively, and whenever I 
did receive criticism or for doing something wrong in the court that you know I always felt like it wasn't um it wasn't harsh criticism it was just fact it was like hey you you made this mistake today all we have to do is focus on this this and this and you're going to get through that the next time and and you're going to get through that match and so it's just constant positive feedback and that's really um really the things that come into my mind when I think of the best coaching lots of positivity and um and above all keeping it keeping it lighthearted and fun I think that's important if it gets too serious um it can it can it can have the opposite effect and players can get tight and they can start hating or resenting the game or resenting the coach and that's the last thing you want I think it's important to keep it fun um and just to be very oh, and the final thing I'd say is to keep the practices specific sometimes um practices can be very um all round and they're not tailored towards the player's game and obviously as you grow up and start playing at a professional level you have to be very very clear on how you want to practice and have very purposeful practice and that's just something i want to add in there that coaches that can create a purposeful practice um type environment uh, they're the ones that are going to help the players grow the most and grow the quickest so thank you very much in terms of you know bad coach player relationship um you know, I have to. I kind of struggle to think about this a little bit, uh, but I do think when you can kind of tell when a coach doesn't really, when maybe you're not their priority, that they're more interested in someone else. Um, I think it's it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out who the coach's priority is within a group. So if you're traveling with a group of players, um, you know who the coach's favorites are. So I think it's important for a coach to really be very. Uh, diligent on spending time with each player. My experiences, as I'm sure Larry, you've said in the presentation, I, I was playing more doubles, would be more, you know, I played with a lot of doubles partners. So I think similar to coaches, I think when you're on a court or you're in an environment, I think when you know the player doesn't necessarily rate you or think, or the coach doesn't rate you or something along those lines, I think you can, the player can pick up on that. So. I think it's very important that you pick a good coach to, uh, like more so even a good person to be traveling with. Um, as I said, it's in an earlier answer, I think it's more collaborative in the relationship that you have with the person. Um, but luckily, I've never had any real horror stories. Um, but yeah, that's all. All right, so is that uh, so? Um, just to thank, thanks, Larry, for um, asking me to be a part of this. Uh, for me, if you go back to the junior days, I think it was the it's the culture, the environment, the I think in terms of maybe you'll go into your presentation. I think the Irish, I think the Irish mentality. Um, you know, like our highest ranked player at the time is two twenty in the world. I think, and you know what you did when you came to Ireland was you really raised the expectations of the players of where we where we wanted to go in terms of college and playing professionally and. Uh, I think that was it was it was fostering an environment that's a more team culture than an individual um piece. So uh yeah, good luck and thank you. Question two, can you explain the way your childhood coach fostered a good relationship with you? Um for me this was, you know, very important that um you know, when you came when Larry, when you came to Ireland you you obviously instilled a kind of a work ethic and belief and um, I think there's almost, in some ways, you were very much a father figure to the, 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 the kids in the squad, which was obviously myself as well. Um, I kind of put you in the same in the same bracket or as the kind of John Wooden philosophy around really helping the person develop um, and obviously their game is going to come along as well. Uh, I think fostering the team culture um, that we were helping each other to improve, and every, each player was pushing each other along. Um, I think it was. I think it was really important as well. Um, even uh, I think you know. I know these days uh, maybe with child protection. I don't know if you're going into that stuff, but we used to go to the cinema a lot. Um, I remember even you asking me at the end of movies, "What was the meaning of this movie? What did you take from it?" And kind of life lessons around it, uh, which is which was. Um, very important. Then the last thing I'll say is, for me personally, I think you know, encouraging us to read, but also not just read, or I suppose learn is the right word, but not just to learn from tennis books, to actually read business books, to read whether it's Tony Robbins, John Wooden, Bruce Lee, Muhammad Ali, all these different great athletes, 
um, to learn from them as well. So I think that's something that I've kept throughout my throughout my life. As of question three, any tour college coaches fostered a good relationship with you, and how that was different the same. For me, it was interesting when I went to college because I left the environment where you were kind of you know we'd go to a movie together. It was very that very personal relationship, and you went into college. And you're one of 12 guys in the team or 16 guys in the team and the coaches, it's a, it's a lot more, um, it's more of a cutthroat business that if you lose matches, you're, you're under, the coach is under a little bit of pressure. Um, but I had a very good relationship with my coach. Again, I think the trust piece is really important. Um, I think the, the relationship as you go through to professional level, I think it becomes more a peer relationship. So the coach is more an equal, I would say, than when you're a junior, when the coach is kind of telling you how to play or you know helping you in terms of technically, tactically, all those types of things. Whereas when you're professional, I think it's more a collaborative piece. And um, so I think that that's a big difference. All right, Larry, thank you very much for asking me to be uh, part of this uh, coach's workshop. Uh, in very interesting topic, something that I've written on, something that I've spoken a lot about. Um, and obviously you were my childhood coach as well. So in terms of the questions, what do you think the most important aspects to having a great player-coach relationship? Um, for me, I suppose different stages of your career, but I think trust is really important that you trust your coach. Um, you trust that tactically they're helping you, that you're... You know, you feel like you're helping, that they're helping you improve um, and that the trust is there. I also think it's important that you can get on well with your coach off the court, that you have that kind of camaraderie because, you know, if you're playing professionally or you're a junior or you're spending a lot of time with the coach, they have a huge impact on your on your life. Um, and I think it's important that you're, you, you get on with them off the court as well. Uh, my story in this and that's not what the intention was in putting this presentation together so I just ask you to trust the fact that you know the only people that I could ask uh, about these relationships for people that I have a good enough relationship with or know me well enough that I could send them the email if I could ask other players that don't know me then they would have told amazing stories about you and the relationships they had but just want you to know it definitely wasn't about me I just went to the people on that that I know well and I will say, just because it's hard to watch those things for me personally, and hopefully for you as a coach, if you ever get a chance, because it's a real blessing when you do, to have an opportunity to hear one of the players talk about that sort of thing, uh, is that the two Jameses, Arv and Steph, are still little kids, but the two Jameses have grown up to be amazing men. Uh, big James here, he's Big James because he's 6'6", six, six. Little James is 6'1". Uh, but Big James, what, you know, he now works as a business consultant. He's flown to Los Angeles to work with banks. He's still living in Dublin uh, to work with banks and, and help their managers. And then the next weekend, he's on Necker Island coaching uh, Richard Branson and all these guys. Kind of, so he's, he's living quite the life, but he's, he's a really amazing guy. And James McGee is actually working in Vegas. He's coaching in the mornings kids. It's a charity that he got to know when he was in college. Um, where basically they help young athletes that could never have the resources to get to the point that they could get a college scholarship. And so they identify these young kids, he coaches them in the mornings, and in the afternoon he goes out to local businesses and just tries to raise money to keep the whole program going as this charity to, to get new kids, get kids college scholarships that don't come from a demographic that could. So, so they're really, really neat guys. I'm really proud of them. Um, anyways. Question three. I did it again. <laughs> Slow learner. For sure. Slow learner. Uh, so just in case you weren't jotting notes rapidly or uh, whichever, I just quickly wrote down the main adjectives that I heard them all say. So as a summary, the players say care, support mentally, challenging, fun, confidence in me, honest with me, mutual respect, trust, openness, dependable, positivity, dedication. Listener, encourage positive labels, help with mental aspect, positive feedback and facts, lighthearted, fun, purposeful practice, trust, camaraderie, camaraderie, instill, instilling work ethic and belief, help a person spend time with movies, encourage them to learn and read. And the, you know, it's so easy because people can use different adjectives if they want, but you can see some really, I think, clear messages forming. Um, and I said to Wayne after after I got these videos back and I was inserting them in my presentation, I said, I only hope that the coaches will believe that I did my part before I sent it to the kids, right? Because so much of this I think is very consistent. 
um, with the first ideas that I mentioned, and we'll tie it all together in the end. The most interesting one, because this is not a setup, you see, I, I didn't do anything with these kids other than send them the, the four questions that I showed you, was to see that three, the only three of the four that talked about negativity nailed the exact same negative trait. And uh, I know as somebody who's, uh, I don't want to say a leader, that sounds presumptuous, but somebody who is in charge of staffs and has to work uh, with other coaches on my team, it is probably the number one complaint I've heard over the years is, you know, that coach favors this player, that coach favors that player. So I would have never put that in a presentation, but it was interesting that that came out as the answer from so many of the players and something that I think we need to be super cautious of. You guys have, you're going to have your 15 minutes of reflections and stuff, but before that, does anybody have like a blink response talking lack of Malcolm Gladwell to looking at this and going like, huh? One thing that struck me, for sure, uh, it, didn't, it didn't surprise me, I don't think, but I think it's important enough that I want to uh, emphasize, it, emphasize it. Steph and James Kluski definitely talked about, with respect to trusting, there was this trusting human being part, but they also said, trust that they know what they're doing with my game, trust they'll make me better. So there is this universal part of, yeah, we need our coaches to be good, are, are competent in developing technical, tactical, physical and mental skills, but other than just some like loosely connected tech tech stuff in a trust column, you realize that none of these things have to do with technique, tactics, methodology, nothing like that. Right? It's just who we are. Uh, I think it's you know it's an interesting one because you have the this big ship little ship relationship. Right? And so in the end you don't start off with some kids saying, I'm not gonna work with you until I trust you. And the same thing, I'm sure they don't start off that way either. You just start in this relationship and, and reality is, and this is what I was gonna say after the next slide, but if this is all seems way too slanted in one direction, the other thing, if you guys don't do this kind of thing, because it's, it's the way my brain works, is I'll point out to you the obvious bias here, right? Because I'm presenting to you what I think is important in a player-coach relationship and what players who I have a very good relationship with think is important in a player-coach relationship. So some other coach with a completely different philosophy uh, would have great relationship with their players and they would just value different things. So this is not universal by any stretch, but I think it's worth learning from. You know? With respect to the trust piece, the answer is just that this always builds over time. Right? Their trust in me it must have built over time. They didn't start with some huge trust. They started with looking for a coach. Right? And the same thing with me. And so when you say, what are the things, little R of there was so cute because I started with him. He was from Calgary, for the Calgary coaches that might have known him over there. And when he came over here last September, he'd been working with Jeff Spears, who's a friend of mine for years. And, uh, you know, we started talking. And I would say, and R alluded to it in the message, um, but I said to R, okay, we need to do this work technically. And I said, I got to tell you, R. And I'd never met the kid. I was just trying to set a tone. I said, like, this is going to take months. I said, this is probably six months to change this. He's like, I could do it in three. I'm like, yeah, that's cute, but uh, we'll see. I said, like, six months would be great. I said, at 16, at six months, you'll be 12 and a half. That'll be enough. You know, you're, you're good. He's like, I'll do it in three. And you know what? He did it in three because he went home and shadow swinged and put extra practice and went to the ball machine. And so you can imagine that starts to build my trust in him. This is the kind of kid who's going to do what he says he's going to do who's gonna buy into the message and follow through. So I just think it's that, as you spend time with people, trust either grows or diminishes. I don't know if that's an answer or not, but it's all I've got. I'm gonna do this right, right? All right, so if we, if we go back to the three that I said at the beginning, and like I said, honest to goodness, I put my presentation together before I sent the video out, so it's just interesting how closely connected they are. Um, but this is what I had just started to think about when you talk about, for us, how do we develop that trust. One of them, and it's part of Louis' original coaching methodology and the four pillars of it. Perfect. I thought I didn't have enough time. I thought I didn't have enough material for three minutes. Um, but to be player-centered, and what does that mean? I think that players can see through coaches that are just there to build their resume. You haven't developed a provincial champion yet, and so you're putting all this extra time in because you want that kid to win provincials for your resume, not because you care about them. Uh, and you've got their back. And so at some point, you know, James Kluski, for example, and I'm sure a lot of you, at least, well, there's not that many of them in the room that are as old as I am, but those people that have been doing this for as long as I have probably have a story like this. But when James was U17, uh, he came to the court one morning and he had just, 
he, he just has a beautiful spirit about him. Derek knows him. I don't know if you ever met James, uh, but he's the, he's a everybody likes him kind of guy. Uh, he just always has that aura about him. He came on court and he just looked miserable. And I was like, what the heck, James? And he said, well, I just got a call. Uh, my parents dropped me off at practice, but my brother was in an accident last night, and I don't know what's going on there in the hospital. And it turned out his brother had a tragic accident, and uh, is a quadriplegic now. Um, the hay bale fell on him and all this kind of stuff. But the point is that over the next three months, when his parents were in the hospital almost 24 hours a day, James just stayed at my house. Right? That's just the way it goes, isn't it? And that's the kind of, like, whatever is going on in life, I've got your back. I'm not just here, as Stephanie said, trying to make some money off of the lesson or something. So, uh, you know, you've got their back. This is my piece, confidential. They know they can confide in you. And that happens more and more as the kids get older, right? You know, like when you're traveling on tour and people are all of a sudden like, I remember, and I, maybe I won't, yeah, that's too confidential. That would be not uh, being able to confide in me. But, you know, I was in situations on tour that were just going, I was just going, what? I'm a tennis coach. How am I in this position? But you just need to be there for your athletes. And so you're doing those things. So. That's the bottom line for how we're, you know, some thoughts on how we could build trust. Belief building is such a bigger notion. I thought I'd just quickly Google it. So I came up with Carl Pickard here, and I just went like this, this, this. So appreciate effort no matter when or lose. Encourage practice to build confidence. Let them figure problems for themselves. Let them act their age. Encourage curiosity. Give them new challenges. Avoid creating shortcuts or making expectations for the child. Never criticize their performance. Treat mistakes like building blocks for learning. Open the door to new experiences. Teach them what you teach them what you how teach them what how you know how to do. I don't know what he's talking about. Don't tell them when you're worried about them. Praise them when they deal with adversity. Offer to help you support, but not too much. Applaud their courage, trying something new. Celebrate excitement and learning. Don't allow them to escape reality by spending their time on the internet. Be authoritative, but not too forceful or strict. That's what that's what Carl Pickard said. Uh, I said this. Um, Anybody who's been part of that before, there's that DVF model that I always use, and the V is vision. You know, if you're trying to help somebody change, you have to be able to create a vision. And so at some point, I think, you know, and, and Klesky talked about that a little bit with the idea of like changing the actual thought process, the standard of just getting into a low level college and never playing pro was the highest standard that Irish players were thinking about at the time. The kid that was 240 in the world there he was talking about was Peter Clark that you mentioned earlier. And Peter Clark was Australian. He just happened to live on an Irish passport, right? And so there just wasn't any good Irish players. And so trying to build a new vision for how good somebody could be. Encourage, 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 encourage. And then connect the dots, bring the facts. It was interesting. McGee even talked about that. And so, again, that just touches down on my coaching methodology a little bit. But at some point, I think the most powerful thing you can say to a player is you realize that you only converted 18% of break points in that match. That's, that's what brought the difference in the match. Now let's dig into that, unpack that, and figure out how we can improve that to 35% or something like this. And that could be the difference in that match. Instead of, why are you such a choke and you're missing? Oh, you got in the spit zone there. Uh, so that was that piece. And then uh, fun and enjoyment, and the only thing that I, I just can't stress enough, it's the only thing that came to my mind, is that we know that this is a 10 to 15 year journey. Uh, if we're going to help these kids reach their full potential, 10,000 hours, I know there's all sorts of you know, um, faults in that logic, or at least the way it's presented publicly, but you know, it takes a long time. I know that uh, when London and I were in the car this morning, we were just talking about at the peak of it, I was spending 150,000 air miles a year, which means that you're spending 16 hour flights from San Francisco to Melbourne beside this player who you've already spent a week with. It is like, bottom line is we spend a ton of time with these kids and these players as they're going along. And if it's not fun and enjoyable, I just don't think you're ever gonna reach that sort of finish line. So absolutely. That's it. Cool.